Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, it's over 12 months since Linda and I first had a discussion about China matters and whether I might sp speak with you. Uh, in that time, of course, COVID intervened and a lot of the dates we discussed uh, had to be cancelled and deferred. And of course now, any discussion with China has to be strongly tempered by the coming federal election and by politicians who might have their own viewpoint, which is not necessarily in Australia's interests, but in their own political interests. Andrew said that uh, I was asked to say, firstly, how I see China. And I think that's really difficult for me to do without talking about me and my family, because who I am will very much determine how I feel about China. I have to confess that I haven't been to a China Matters function before. And so I went back and on YouTube watched and listened to Jason Lee, who spoke about, I think about 10 months ago, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, I couldn't help but note how different Jason's experiences were growing up in Australia. And that was many, many generations after I grew up. And during his discussions, Jason mentioned uh, his attempts to break into politics. And uh, I'm really pleased to acknowledge that at the recent by-elections held in New South Wales, Jason was successful in the seat of Strathfield, and I'm really delighted that he did that. Chinese, by and large, have not been as active in politics as, for example, Indians. And in other states, particularly in Victoria, the Indian community have been very active in getting involved in politics. I'm pleased that Jason did stand, I'm even more pleased that he was successful because I think until the Chinese acknowledge the importance of politics, then governments really won't take much notice of us and how we feel. My four grandparents were all Han Chinese. All four of them grew up in a village just north of Guangzhou. They were of the Hakka clan and I'm led to believe, and a lot of the things I'm going to say today I have no proof of, but the family talks about it, I'm led to believe <laughs> that they were active in the Taiping Rebellion. My grandfather was very much involved. Uh, he was a Christian, which makes it even more likely if he was involved in the Taiping Rebellion. And being Hakka, I think, was another reason why he was very likely to be involved. My grandfather then, in coming to Australia was probably a refugee from the successful national government at the time where the rebellion people were really very badly treated. And a lot of the people who fought in the Taiping Rebellion did migrate were refugees 
but they very largely went to countries in the Pacific Rim and enormous numbers went to Canada and the US. And if you look at the Hakka websites, it's extraordinary how much is there and how much of it comes from their activities in Canada and in the US. And it's largely that that Chinese migration to North America, that so much of Chinese culture and heritage were maintained and retained. My maternal grandfather came to the Victorian gold fields in, in 1867. And all this is documented in the history of the New South Wales Presbyterian Church. There's no other reason why I would know exactly when he arrived. He was given the name of Joshua Youngway, which was an anglicised form of his Chinese name, which was Zhou Rongwei. He went to the gold fields in Ballarat, and by all accounts, he wasn't a very successful gold miner, and very quickly there was records of him being very active in the community work of the Presbyterian Church. He was employed by the Presbyterian Church on the gold fields, then undertook further studies with the church in Victoria and was subsequently ordained as a Presbyterian minister. He was called to establish the first Chinese Presbyterian church in Sydney uh, in Foster Street. And at the time, the church was really active, not so much in a missionary sense, but in a social sense, and they looked after the Chinese migrants, taught them English, taught the women mother craft and how to look after their children in Australia. My grandfather went back to China and took a wife and brought her back. and. Uh, as I said, my four grandparents all came in the same village. So I think there's little doubt that it was an arranged marriage. And I guess like a lot of arranged marriages, it seemed to work. Perhaps the expectation of the partners of each other were not quite so great. <laughs> my family, were in the manse in Summer Hill. And my mother's family all were very involved with the church. Uh, one of my uncles was the session clerk or the head lay person in the church, but all of them taught English and all of them were involved in helping the Chinese migrants to settle and access the services available in Australia. My uncle, and there's a reason for me telling you this and I'll refer to it again later, was the first medical graduate of the University of Sydney. And one of his classmates went into politics Earl Page and the Page family and the Bailey Tarts were very close friends of my family. My father was a commissioner for the KMT, the Kuomintang, based in Jakarta and came to Sydney very often.
uh, my grandfather, now a clergyman in Sydney, had very close working relationships with the KMT in Sydney because at that time the KMT were really very active in community welfare. My father, after he met my mother, and once again, I'm sure it was an arranged meeting, they married and went back to China, where he continued in Chiang Kai-shek's government based in Nanking. And that's why I was born in Nanking. That part of China, Manchuria, and then Nanking became the, in the sights of the Japanese government and the Japanese army when they invaded. And in the early part of 1937, they got very close to Nanking and eventually reached the outskirts of Nanking at which time my father arranged for my mother and my sister and me to sm be smuggled out of Nanking. And whilst that sounds a little dramatic, I think you could understand that the government ministers and the high government officials wouldn't want the rest of the population to know they were getting their family out. We came down, smuggled out, and went to Hong Kong, where we stayed with friends until we were able to get a ship to Sydney and to join my mother's family. I had my third birthday on the ship coming down the New South Wales coast. When we landed, part of our welcoming group were not only the family, but Earl Page, who was then Sir Earl Page, and he carried me ashore. I was three. Earl Page was the government minister at the time and was not challenged. My arrival was not documented. My mother and my sister were appropriately <clears throat> processed, but I wasn't. And so I had the trifecta. I was a refugee. I was a boat person, albeit a passenger liner, <laughs> but I was an irregular arrival. And I like to remind some of the people who were in government, I'm um, say I live retired when I say they were in government because the government's continued. I like to remind them that not all refugees were sponges. A lot of them contributed and continue to contribute a lot to our society. I mentioned that my mother's family lived in Summer Hill and we lived in the manse. My grandfather had died by that time, but I had my upbringing in Summerhill. I went to Summerhill Public School. I went to Fort Street on Taverners Hill. And I went to the University of Sydney to study medicine with my fees being covered by the Commonwealth Government. So I think there's little wonder that I am very passionate about public education and the need 
to see publication, public education get appropriate support. Because whilst Chinese and a lot of other Asian communities and a lot of other people in this country were very supportive of education and determined that their children should be properly educated. They also recognised, not so much me and my family, but others recognised that education was perhaps the only escape from poverty in the country as they try to earn their way in an Australian society. My family were determined that I should be a good Australian. And so nobody spoke English to me. I didn't speak English at the time. I only spoke Cantonese when I was a three year older, but I was forced to learn English. Also to be a good Australian, when I was 12 years old, I was given a scotch every Sunday evening. <laughs> and whilst today I very much regret not having Chinese language, I also have to say that scotch whiskey is still my favourite beverage. <laughs> I've spent most of my life in community matters with the broader Australian community. Paediatrics, medicine, child welfare, arts, the culture of the region. And those things have been my pursuits I recently had the honour of being the Foundation Chair of the Museum of the Chinese in Australia and several members of that board are here today. It was, in fact, the first purely Chinese association or organisation I was involved in. And that's not because I was avoiding Chinese and Chinese activities, but because I was an Australian whose friends were kids that I went to school with, people I went to university with, and people who shared my own interests. But it does remind me that being Chinese I perhaps had an obligation to do more for that community, which I didn't do. But I guess we're all limited in how much time we have and how many activities we can undertake. For my whole life, I saw myself very much as an Australian, albeit an Australian with a Chinese face and an Australian very proud of his Chinese heritage. My life has been a very conservative one. My family still had strong connections with the KMT and Taiwan. So that I can't possibly see that I could be accused by those people who are interested of having left wing views. My politics are, of course, being concerned with children and health and education and the arts. My politics 
are to the left of centre. But that doesn't make me in any way a communist stooge. And when I look at China, I think about and I look at the people and the cultural heritage. The Chinese Communist Party is not something that I have ever been concerned with. I, however, would be the first to admit that under the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese people have done much better than they were doing under the Nationalist Government and I suspect are doing much better than they would have done if the Nationalists had remained in power. But that position that the people have enjoyed have been at a considerable price, especially when judged by a Western community like us in Australia. There have been problems, and I have no doubt that the CCP have made a lot of mistakes. But I was heartened by the fact that recently, some years ago, the Chinese government acknowledged the errors they made with the one child policy and were prepared to back off. Now, if they were prepared to acknowledge their mistakes and to change them, I would like to think that they would be prepared to look at other errors they made, particularly in the west of China and in the southwest, of the Muslims of the west and the minority groups of the southwest. But they need time to do this. And I don't think the West, and certainly not Australia and the US, are in the mood to give them time. So I suspect there will be continuing confrontations in these regards. And I'm saddened by that, but I understand it. I suspect that the Chinese government might have considered ways of looking at a different approach, particularly in the West and the Southwest, if it could be done without loss of face. And I don't need to explain to you as an audience interested in Asia about what I mean by loss of face. But a government cannot lose face. And we need to understand their position. And I think to be supportive of them as they very slowly change things. One of the things that, is, that China has done well in is improving the health and welfare of the Chinese people. And I'm really proud that I spent a period of time as the chairman of the board of the George Institute for Global Health, where we worked very closely with our colleagues in China. And it hasn't just been one way thing, because Australia is a small country it's really very hard for us to undertake a lot of trials, drug trials and other trials, because we don't have the population to be able to do that quickly enough. Whereas by working with our Chinese colleagues, we were able to undertake and to complete studies in a lot of areas, such as uncontrolled hypertension. And 
we have benefited enormously, we meaning Australia, by collaborating with the Chinese and working with them in that way. There is a hell of a lot of goodwill for Australia in China. And I'm talking about medicos and scientists. I'm not talking about politicians. Mm. I think we need to look at how we might be able to exploit that and to help our peoples understand each other better. Now, why do I see China like this? I share the core values of Chinese people, having grown up in a traditional Chinese family, albeit in a totally Western environment. I think our social diversity in Australia can serve as well as we try to balance political demands. I mentioned before that education is a core value. A lot of Asians, a lot of recent migrants and a lot of native Australians hold. I don't know why we can't look at the things we share, pursue those more actively and be prepared to share experiences and assistance. I think the Colombo plan was one of the greatest things that ever happened. And we were able to share Australian expertise with a lot of students in the region. I remember going to Kuala Lumpur at the time when Pauline Hansen was very active. And I went up there for foreign affairs, talking to Southeast Asian people about what it was like being Chinese growing up in Australia. I remember when I went to KL that three of the cabinet ministers were Colombo Plan fellows and their support for Australia and what we were doing was very strong. I think it's wonderful that Australians can be sent to Asia, but I think we've got to actually bring more young, active Southeast Asian and East Asian people to Australia. Not because we do things better, but because we do things differently. And that difference really is important when you're studying and researching a whole raft of activities. Let me just check my time. I think I'm running out of time, but if I could just quote, and when I quote, I like to do it accurately, so you'll allow me to read this. In Linda Javen's The Shortest History of China, she wrote about Liu Shu, who was writing about the history of chess. And he said, those in the game see less clearly than those observing from outside. And whilst I have great reticence in coming before you and talking about China, because I really know very little about China compared to most of you, I can see how my ignorance can be quite useful as I reflect on China, Australia, and our activities. Now, I'm going to get into trouble talking too long. If I just have a few more minutes. I talked about Asian face. And I think it's really important that we recognise face when we're dealing with people, especially those who have a different view to us. And that we must remember that face is just important as when we're talking to our friends and when we're talking to those 
who are not so friendly. I often hear statements made with a domestic audience in mind, seeking political approbation and advantage in the lead up to the coming election. But so often the wider Australian public is not paying attention, but people overseas do pay attention and do listen and do note what is said, even though I think sometimes those views weren't meant for them, but for our local population. I'm not suggesting that our leaders avoid the truth, but words do matter in relationships with Asia. If there is the possibility of associating some adverse news events with China, then some in our current media highlight them. I think it is designed to make people suspicious of China, whether it is proven or unproven. The part of our media that I'm talking about are not intent on reporting the facts, but on influencing what they think. We should think. Politicians must be wary of threatening the multicultural diversity, which is the linchpin of contemporary Australian success. Winning a few racist votes may today result in an avalanche of dissent tomorrow. To me, it is not about what our approach to China should be or what our government's approach should be, but I think we should be looking at it from the, thought, from the sort of Australia we want to be in an Asian region. Strong in our confidence in ourselves, but an Australia who feels right about itself and trusts our leaders. Thank you.